Welcome everyone to Primary Physiologic Concerns in Proper Bike Fitting. Our speaker today is Chris Balzer. Chris is a professional bike fitter and operates Bicycle Fit Guru in the Minneapolis St. Paul area. He's done thousands of bike fits, including many for professional cyclists and triathletes. Chris has been a Moxie user for several months now. Just an overview of the format for today. The total presentation time is about 25 to 30 minutes. We'll stop about halfway through uh, to take a question break, uh, and then we'll have a longer Q&A session at the end. We'll aim to finish the webinar up by 11.45. The recording will be posted on our website and on our forum, where we hope to continue the discussion that gets started today. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Chris, and he can get going with the presentation. Hello, everybody. I, uh... I need to say before we get started that uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to present today is based on my own findings. I am primarily a triathlon bike fitter, a tri-bike fitter. I, uh, last year I did 640 fits, which is a ton of that, probably 450 were triathletes, um, ranging from nice to professionals, and, um, and yeah, that's my deal. So we'll get started. Physiological concerns of triathlon bike fit. Turn the page. Turn the page. Turn. There we go. Okay, so the first thing we need to recognize, and I think most of you know that if you've been on a bike, is that cycling is not normal. Um, the problem is if there's uh, predominantly a closed chain activity with mostly fixed and symmetrical movement patterns. And I say mostly closed because it's not always closed. There's some movement patterns when you're standing and such that, you, that, are, that, are, that are variable. Um, the other thing is that we're in a quadruped position, which is just horrible for our spine. And uh, the saddle, you know, if, you, if that's not enough, you have a saddle that's jammed up in between your legs. That's pretty much designed to enforce a symmetrical pelvic obliquity and rotation. Okay, and so I spoke in medicine and cycling this past summer on difference between tri and TT fitting, and I think the most important variable is that with a tri fitting, it's one portion of a race. So guy gets done swimming, his arms are all pumped, his back is all beefy, gets on the bike, uh, has to be able to breathe and relax the upper body so that he can transition into run or his she can transition into run and be effective. Um, it's not easy to do. Um, so ideally, we want to be as relaxed as possible in the posture muscles. We want our phasic muscles, the muscles that are driving the bike, to be the, the most effective at cycling and preserving muscles for running. And we want to relax our upper body so that we can recover from swimming. Most of you know all that stuff. So. Um, things that I look at with the tri position. Tri bikes are different than time tri bikes and other bikes because they have a more aggressive seat tube angle. Um, and this is relatively recent, but um, I think pretty much every bike manufacturer now has uh, one or two settings, but they can always be positioned so that the center of the saddle is at 78 degrees relative to the bottom bracket. Now, I've heard some professional fitters and people have been around the industry for a long time that actually say, you know, well, the reason they did that, that is because uh, triathletes hadn't, didn't have any bike experience and they couldn't handle a bike really well, uh, so this made it easier. And I don't think that's true. Um, from my perspective and this stuff, you know, I guess Dan Emfield is the guy who first really got into this whole, uh, the effectiveness of the C-tube angle thing. Um, so there's a lot of research on metabolic efficiency and transition times with more effect, more aggressive C-tube angles or more steep C-tube angles. Um, and it's all positive. So when I look at it, in my own experience, I'm thinking about diaphragm function, inspiratory muscle fatigue, um, and the psoas. So when I move the saddle forward more towards 78 degrees, or, or to be honest with you, I have a lot of triathletes that are riding a virtual C2 mangle, which would be this where their greater trochanter is over the bottom bracket of like 84 to 90, and uh, one or two that are probably at 92 degrees, 93 degrees. Um, that the more open the hip angle, the more effective the transition because the psoas hasn't been in a position or the hip hasn't been in a position that is conducive to psoas tightening. So you've got diaphragm function, you've got inspiratory muscle fatigue, um, and you've got overall tidal flow. 
This is a fancy little video for you from Anatomy Trains showing what happens when a person breathes. So as I inhale, the diaphragm pull, I mean the quadrates lumbar muscles pull the diaphragm down and as I exhale it releases. If a, if a person is positioned where there is a lot of posterior pelvic rotation and a tight hip, it makes it very difficult to utilize oxygen effectively. Okay, active, activity specific muscle recruitment. We want to use the muscles we're using for cycling. We want to preserve the muscles that we're going to use for running. The problem with these two charts is that I can take any cyclist and change their position and have entirely different SEMG uh, measurements. The further back I, put, I position a cyclist, the more they're going to be using their glutes and their hamstrings, the lower the handlebars, and further back, the more posterior muscle groups of the upper back, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The deal, what we're trying to do is make it so that a person can ride their bike without wasting energy that they would then use for running. What we're trying to target is the larger, more economical muscle groups, primarily poster, posterior legs, to drive the cyclist. And we want to make sure that we are not overtaxing any part of the body. If you look at this person, Kathy Instead, very conservative position, but this girl, she's an amateur, uh, professional amateur triathlete who wins every race she enters. Um, super comfortable on the bike, as you see, very open hip angle. Here's Kristen Armstrong, super duper fast, not an extremely effective hip, hip angle. As a matter of fact, I know the person who worked with her originally, and she is riding on one side of the saddle, um, and the saddle is slightly bent off to the side so that she can ride driving mostly with this right leg. Okay. Postural muscle recruitment. Posture muscle recruitment patterns. We want to minimize postural recruitment tension for full recovery from swimming. The relaxed arms, I consider the lumbar, aside from relaxed arms, I consider the, these two, the lumbar spine is the biggest problem. So we have our thoracic spine, which is supported by the sternum. We have our pelvis, which is supported by the pubis and the sacrum. But this lumbar spine says, why, why, why are you going to jack me up and toss me over the front end of a bike? So when I'm fitting people, I don't do a one-shot fit. People, they come to me and I don't say, okay, fine, you're good to go for triathletes. And the reason is that if I start with the conservative position, I'm more likely to get the stabilizer muscles functioning properly and less likely to keep them in a state of constant tension, which can promote uh, asymmetry and leading problems, et cetera. So here is the large muscle groups pulling a person up into spinal extension, and there's just a lot of muscle there too. So if you think of overall energy expenditure, these muscles are consuming a lot of energy. They have poor origin insertions from a, a coordination standpoint, a stability standpoint. See, they're just almost like randomly placed versus these stabilizers, which are fantastic for uh, holding the vertebrae relative to the neck in an extended position. Super important, if you look at these muscles, these are just some, some of the stabilizers, the multiple muscles. If you look at these, that's the golf swing, right? Golfers are the hardest people in the world for me to fit because they tend to be twisted. So you'll see somebody on the bike and their forearms will actually want to be off to one side. Um, unilateral breathers, same thing. They get really good at twisting one way, not so good at the other. Okay, try positioning. So, I can make any muscle groups fire by changing the position. I can have more anterior recruitment, I have more posterior recruitment, I can have upper body recruitment, I can have lower body recruitment, blah, 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 based on what I do with the position. These are just nice little pictures. This was in case I was going too slow. I think I'm not, because I had a lot of coffee. So, effective hip angles first. Effective hip angles are no brainer. Right here, Whoa, okay, right here, you have your asis and you have your femur. And if the femur hits that bone, all bets are off. You have then exceeded the functional hip angle. And if you exceed the functional hip angle, there will be problems at the hip or sacrum or knee or something. If you, in the most uh, drastic 
uh, examples of that, if you're looking from the, at the person from the front, you'll see that the knee tracks laterally as it approaches the top of the pedal stroke and then comes back down closer to the top tube. Now, when I say that, there are a number of reasons that could happen. You know, you could have a tight uh, TFL or short leg on the opposite side, but it's important and easy to stick your thumb right there and see if it's getting crushed. Ways that you can make a position more effective if a person is not very aerodynamic with a uh, with a uh, ineffective hip angle is to shorten the cranks or move the person more forward relative to the bottom bracket, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's the first component of an effective hip angle. The second component of an effect, effective hip angle is where they generate the most power. So when I'm fitting somebody, I'll move them through a variety of positions to find out where they are creating the most power and having the smoothest pedal stroke. I will then move into the next part of our fitting, which involves establishing center gravity, et cetera. We'll go there, I think center gravity is next. Okay, center gravity is a big deal. Center gravity will determine muscle recruitment patterns as well as ballast forward to aft. If I position a person, so we'll consider this the bottom bracket, the center of this fulcrum. Here's a bottom bracket, here is a butt, here is a bottom bracket, here is a butt. This butt is further behind the bottom bracket, which unweights the arms. Contributing to that unweighted arms, unweighted arms is that she is in a higher position. She may be in a higher position because being further back on the saddle increases the tension of these posterior muscle groups, which makes it more difficult to be lower and further forward. Women typically do ride, in my experience, a more relaxed seat tube angle on the tri bike, and I don't necessarily know if it's because they create more power with a more open hip or if it's because they just don't tolerate a bunch of weight in their upper body. Here, this guy is riding super drop position. I bet you if you stuck a thumb in there, it would probably get crushed. But his saddle also looks a little low. Um, so that could be contributing to it. But anyway, he is way forward. See, he's right on the, on the rivet, they would call it. And if you drop the plumb line, it's probably at 85, 85, 86 degrees relative to the bottom bracket. This is huge component in bike fitting. And it needs to be explored along the range. It's not just taking a client, come in, slam the saddle forward, drop the bars down, and sing your triathlete. Have a nice day. Hey, and, and one thing. One more thing. Uh, Chris, I'll just yes. jump on uh, with a question here. Um, how do you identify when respiratory muscle fatigue is an issue with a cyclist? You can well. You can look at tidal. You can look at tidal flow, and or you could actually have them report back and tell you what happened during the ride. And you can use EMG to determine how much tension there is back here. So this person would probably be a candidate for IMF. And if I ran the, if this, if these muscles are tonic, I mean, you could do it with the moxie too. But I think that's, I think that's something we would discuss in, in another uh, seminar. Increased posterior muscle tension, and the oh, increased posterior muscle tension will also increase inspiratory muscle fatigue. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, great, thank you. Um, and just, just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you'd like to ask some questions for the Q&A session at the end, there is a panel off on the right side of your screen where you can type in the questions. Uh, and so we'll, we'll be taking more questions at the end. I've got that off to the start so I can see my PowerPoint, so wait. Okay. Yep. And we'll, yep. Yeah. We'll just uh, t type the questions in as you go, and then uh, we'll we'll, uh, we'll 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 bring them up at the end when uh, when Chris is done with the presentation. Okay. You're taking my time. All right. There we go. Okay. So, ooh, it did a fancy thing that time. Cockpit reach. Cockpit reach is entirely uh, individual specific, and a lot of it has to do with the shape of their spine. Somebody who has a very flat spine is going to have a longer cockpit than somebody who has a rounded spine. Some people have really long legs and really short arms. Some people have really short legs and really long torso. The deal is this. Never look at a bike when determining differential or reach. Look at the person. And you have to see the person folded over the bike because all of this posterior tension is going to impact their reach. So what can we do to, when we're looking at reach? I like to see a person who has somewhere to go. So this person, in my opinion, does not have much of a place to go. When they load up, these muscles are going to tighten up. The glutes, the QL, everything back here is going to fire. 
and he is going to slide further forward on the saddle. Oops, I did that again. Slide further forward in the saddle. When people exceed functional sh their shoulder function, the scapular retraction, their core falls apart, um, and it impacts breathing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So think of the back like a leaf spring, regardless of how it's shaped. Make it so that the arms are slightly in front of the elbows, but not so much. You know, it's it's really a, it's really a, a balancing act between using the bones to relax the upper body and having enough room for you to go somewhere. If you look at time trialists, those of you that are looking at these people, time trialists actually shrug their shoulders up in front of their bodies so that they can get lateral uh, thoracic breathing. Cockpit differential, again, entirely um, individual and very affected by seat tube angle, saddle positioning. If I move a person forward, it opens up their hip so they can then ride a more aggressive position. This person is not optimized. You see how there, how much posterior pelvic rotation there is here? So what I find in my experience is that if I raise up the bars a little bit, this part of their thoracic spine drops down into the position and frequently releases this back. It's almost like it's a neurological response. When you, if you reach your arms as far away as you possibly can and truly do that, you'll notice that your lumbar spine pulls back away from you. And I think that's what happens. The other thing is, if you have excessive cervical extension to see down the road, um, you, it interferes with your, uh, with, with your breath volume and also inhibits uh, hip flexion. So yes, it's important to keep your head down, should be able to see, but if, when you've got a rider on the bike, you can take your fingers, put it on the spine, see how much cervical extension there is, ask them to take a deep breath in with their head looking up, ask them to take a deep breath in with their head relaxed, you'll notice a huge difference. Um, and along those lines, helmet up or down, what really matters is that your face is not flat. This is a flat face, okay? So the wind sees that, okay? This back being this high doesn't matter nearly as much as this face being flat. If this back was this high and she could drop her head down and make, her, make it smooth like Kathy's, then she would be more aerodynamic. As a matter of fact, Kathy, this position, even though she's higher, is probably more aerodynamic than this position. Leg extension. So I know a lot of fitters like to think, like to uh, set up the saddle height according to the person's, uh, the most extension they can get out of a leg. I'm just not on board with that. I go with whatever works best. And I look at the foot. So knee extension is important, but also ankling is important. If a leg extends as far as it can go, and then you start to have uh, plantar flexion activity, at the foot to make up for it, even if the knee is bent this much, then in my opinion, the saddle is too low. Things you can do to that will impact leg effect uh, extension, everything. So consider the uh, posterior chain as being, a, being one of the largest factors in leg extension, aside from saddle height. If I move the saddle forward, it releases the posterior muscle groups and allows the legs to have to appear longer because the pelvis isn't getting jacked into an anterior rotation. Um, moving the saddle back tightens up the posterior chain. It will also take the leg with it. Cockpit. Cockpit's a big deal. This is typical tri cockpit setup with the arms, shoulders, elbows being slightly more narrow than the shoulders um, to facilitate uh, lateral thoracic breathing, relaxed shoulders, et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that you don't hear a lot that you might have noticed if you do try fitting is that the hand position, there is no right extension. You could have a, you, you may have a J-bend, you may have an S-bend, I mean a J-bend or an S-bend or a chicane or straight. What matters is that your wrist is relaxed. And the reason is that your wrist, your natural wrist angle is the best position for your shoulders to release into the arrow bars. If you take your hand and you rotate your pinky towards the underside of your arm, you'll notice that your shoulder kind of gets jacked a little bit too. So when I'm fitting people, this is one of the major um, indicators that a person's fit is starting to come around if the extensions are right. If a person has always got a hand position like this regardless of what I'm doing, guess what? They shouldn't be in the drop. They should be here. The only exception is if this is a limp hand. 
sometimes people just drop their hands. They just drop right over the bar like that, and they like it. Symmetry. Here's another cool video for you. I made this one. So symmetry function is huge as well. Why? Because if the body's in a state of tension, it's in a state of tension. If, now i got to go back to get that back. If this, for this person, they are, broke their tibia when they were a kid, and they actually have a short right leg. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I wanted to pause it. All right. So let me get it back here. That is the pause button. I'm going to pause it if it goes away again. I'm going to play. Okay. So short leg, right hip drop, left hip high, right shoulder low, left eye T-band's getting stretched, and they've got a saddle sore right there. Why not on the short side? Because the short side sucks the, the thigh or the rammy into the saddle laterally. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes the saddle sore is on this side, but this is an actual client of mine. Um, and increased QL activity. So one of the things that I do for symmetry analysis for people so that they can see what I'm talking about, and believe me, is I'll run, I have an integrated 3D program, EMG, EMG uh, that allows me to measure QL recruitment patterns as well as, as well as medial lateral leg muscle recruitment patterns. Um, and I guess I could use the shoulders too because this would be loading um, to determine uh, symmetry. And I think there's an application for MOXIE there too, which I will get into uh, soon enough. But straighten a person out and they're just grooving. The only thing that's important to, re to remember is that if a person is asymmetrical and it is not a major asymmetry, you need to consider the fact that what you do change, to change on their bike fit is going to impact their run. So if somebody has got a little bit of asymmetry or a little scoliosis and they're completely asymptomatic and happy, happy, and they run great off the bike, I am much more cautious um, about making changes. The thing that does make a huge improvement if you're not going to make any changes is getting some conformable insoles in the shoes. Not corrective, but conformable. Um, and the reason, well, if they need corrective, corrective's fine, but most of the time, conformable work just fine. It's just taking up surface area in the, in the shoe. It's making it so that the pressure distribution is equal, and it allows the body, for some reason, just to feel better about cycling in general, even if there's a mild asymmetry. A lot of times, uh, they, you, when you look at a person, you'll see that one arch is higher than the other, and that just seems to help. Okay, pedaling dynamics. Here is the problem with more aggressive feet tube angles. As you shift a person forward on the bike, their center of gravity, making the seat tube, increasing the seat tube angle, you change ankle flexion approaching top dead center. So the ankle angle, the closed ankle angle, is tighter as you move the saddle forward. As you move the saddle back, it's more open. As you move the saddle forward, you reduce the ankle angle, which increases radial load on the crank arm in this area. So here's a, this is measuring the counterproductive pedaling, this is the effective pedaling, and this is what's happening right to left on a client. This leg is obviously has a lot more counterproductive pedaling than this one does, but uh, what's really happening is that they can't get their foot over the top of the pedal stroke. For those of you that don't know, your pedal's actually about a centimeter, centimeter and a half higher at the top of the pedal stroke than it is in the bottom, because at the top of the pedal stroke, you have to account for the fact that, yes, it is on top of the spindle, but you need to include the pedal spindle in that measurement. So what do you do? Move the cleats back and teach them to keep their ankle 90 degrees or whatever it takes to make it so that when you stand behind them, they're pedaling the bike, you can't use your pinky finger to stop them from pedaling as they get to this phase in the pedal stroke. Moxie research in bike fitting. So the guys have asked me to do some research with bike fitting using the Moxie, and like I explained earlier, I am busy, and I don't have time to do it now, but I plan to do some stuff during the off season. The things that I think would be uh, the three areas that I think deserve attention are tidal volume, symmetry, and crank length. For tidal all these all these three variables would have a controlled cadence and ergo so that you would be able to really uh, isolate what you're looking at. Um, for the tidal volume, you'd, you'd modify the effective C2 angle. Um, I don't know what HA is. Anybody? I wrote that down. I should know. Center gravity, I think it was handlebar differential, um, and cockpit length. 
And what you do is you'd monitor the SMO2 at the THB, QL, and VASTA. If you've got a person who is able to get more oxygen into their body than the, the, must, the oxygen should, if you have a baseline of SMO2 in the legs at a fixed cadence and ergo, that SMO2 value should increase. It won't happen instantaneously. And one of the things that I talked to Roger about is making it so that uh, there is a streaming version of SMO2 and THB that is more granular, so you can really see the changes uh, more easily. The second would be symmetry. The same way that I use it, uh, EMG, um, you could modify the foot shoe pedal interface, put the SMO2 and THB, S, monitor SMO2 and th, THB at the deltoids, QL, and or medial lateral quads. So deltoids, when a person has a short leg, they tend to load the same arm, um, though not always, especially if they've had an AC separation or something. 99% um, of the time, the QL um, is tighter, although tendencies for cyclists to have a, right, a, a tighter QL anyway, or I guess just for people in general. And the medial lateral quads will show um, frequently if one hip is hiked more than the other. Um, crank length is the biggie. So I've been doing a lot of work with crank length. I'm good friends with John Cobb. And uh, at the Medicine of Cycling this summer, one of the biggest topics was crank length and how anybody can ride any crank between 145 and 185 and 155 and 185. And there is no difference in their power or metabolic cost. There is 3% better or worse um, past those two uh, lengths, 195, 145, or two. In my experience, well, first, the thing that's important to, uh, to know if you are changing crank length is that, well, it, well, well, the idea behind using a shorter crank is that it allows you to get more aerodynamic. Um, by opening the hip more, you also need to raise the saddle and move it back slightly, in my experience, to make it so that the person is uh, using the leg the same way. The advantages are, um, you know, when you look at a bicycle, you look at the crank arm, yes, a longer crank arm has more mechanical leverage. You look at a person, and relative to the crank arm, though, and a person has more biomechanical leverage with less knee and hip flexion. So the idea is shorter cranks, more power, because you're not bending your leg and your hip as much. Um, the uh, you, some people would argue that the increased cadence will also increase cardiovascular function, but it doesn't because foot velocity is responsible for cardiovascular function, not cadence. Cadence doesn't change much and um, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, you could monitor SMO2 uh, and THB at the QL and Vastar or wherever else you'd want to, and if the cranks were lower, um, if, the cr if a shorter crank was better, then you should have higher levels, all things considered. Um, something else I wanted to say about that. Oh, yeah. So that 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 uh, medicine is cycling statement that I made about them finding no difference in crank length. I do find a difference. Every single person that I put on shorter cranks required two to three weeks to fully accommodate, but for one who had a large power increase. And that's not a very large subject pool. I'd say it's probably thirty people. Um, but it's sufficient to, uh, to, to warrant finding a different way to determine whether crank length is good, uh, is better using the MOXIE. Let me rephrase that so it makes more sense. Because it takes three weeks to determine whether or not a crank length is going to be effective, a shorter crank length, it puts leads in the, the rider's mind the question as to whether or not it's really going to happen. If we can show that there is uh, increased oxygen utilization by the muscles or more oxygen getting to the muscles, um, would be a better way to say that, uh, it makes it easier to make that conversion. And that's the uh, presentation. I did it in record time. All right. Okay. Great. We'll let we'll let the uh, we'll let you just uh, show those references here for a few seconds uh, each, just uh, so that in the recording uh, uh, people can find those back. Uh, we've got a couple of questions uh, here that have come in. Uh, the first one is, uh, what EMG technology do you use? I use the BTS bioengineering technology. It is considered uh, some of the best in the world. 
which uh, why is that, or what what what's your what 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 features of that do you do you prefer? What features of the SEMG? I agree. I I like the fact that I can do all of my own programming for one. So it's the only they they're the only company that provides protocols that are entirely modifiable by the user. Um, the sensors are extremely light, um, so that there's they don't fall off as a rider starts sweating. Um, and their program is under constant revision. They are uh, you know they're used by the Mayo Clinic and by NASA and by uh, hospitals and medical facilities everywhere around the country, around the world, and very few uh, SEMGs can actually uh, can fall into that classification because they lack the same kind of technology. Okay. Um, next question is, when do you decide to use Surface EMG during a bike fit? Whenever I want. So usually I do it when a client, so I don't think surface EMG is necessary for bike fitting. Um, I want to make that clear. I think that it's important to be able to make a gross appraisal of somebody. I have a lot of technology and I don't, I don't use it except to either demonstrate a point, record a finding, or make a referral. That's the easiest way to do it, to say that. Okay. Uh, we've got one more question here. Uh, are there considerations in terms of performance against long-term health? Could they, can they add some more information to that? Considerations, re, re, performance, long-term health regarding, is this killing you slowly? Is that the question? I, I think so. Did, yeah, are, are there, is there long-term damage versus short-term performance gains? Maybe you could. Uh, I don't think I'm the right person. I don't think I'm the right person to answer that question. I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm a bike fitter, um, <laughs> and that's what I do. I've heard. I have had coaches tell me that they think that yes, there is that this is an unnatural thing to do to a human body, and that, and I have a lot of physical therapy and chiropractors who say yes, it is a horrible thing to do to the body. Um, specifically, running people that are 65 years old and insist on continuing to run that have been running their whole lives that they're the hardest people to work with because their bodies are really beat up. Okay. Uh, uh, another question here. What is the shortest crank length that is suitable for cyclists, in your opinion? And this would be a normal height cyclist, um, 180 centimeters tall. Uh, 155. And that's based, on, that's based on research that I've gotten from John Cobb and also, um, yeah, John Cobb. I think he might he would maybe go lower because there's an aerodynamic benefit to the smaller cranks. The less leg movement, the le the the shorter the movement of the legs vertically, short the least amount of uh, the less wind um, is affected. But I'd say 155s. I'll put a lot of people on 155s, and they and the, the they feel an immediate improvement in uh, perceived comfort and notice very little change in the crank length itself. Okay. Um, here's one. Uh, let's see. Any techniques for breathing that you recommend, like breath play? I'm not sure I understand that one, but I'll see if you do. So I, I like the Posture Restoration. I don't know if anybody is familiar with Posture Restoration Institute, PRI. Um, and I think that it's important to do exercise that target breathing between the thoracic and lumbar spine. So um, I would say probably T12 to L3 breathing. And you can do this, actually, I, I just had a lady uh, teach me a new technique, um, which is more than I can really get into on this, this in this topic, but, um, but it's extremely effective at getting that part of the back to release um, where there's tension. You can even just have somebody sit down on a bench and bend forward and kind of slouch, put their hand on their low back and ask them to breathe into your hand. And if you do it for a while, Oh, we, we lost your mic. Uh, we lost your mic there, Chris. There you go. I think you're back now. I have my hand on it. How long there, was I gone? Just for a few seconds. You, you were okay, talking. So you were talking about holding someone's hand on or holding your hand on someone's back when they were when, when they breathe. If you place your hand on somebody's back while they're seated in a crouched forward position, relax, and ask them to breathe into their low back, most often after a minute or two they can do it. And that the idea there is you're breathing into your diaphragm, so you breathe into the base of your belly, the Buddha belly 
and then into your back, and then laterally up through the uh, thoracic spine or the ribcage. But for my purposes, I don't get into the well, the laterally stuff. You know, they can go to Pilates for that. But the uh, it's just to bring awareness to that low back and the tension. Okay. Uh, the next question. Are there significant differences between time trial and road positions? Yes. Um, a time trial position is a difficult, in my opinion, a time trial position is a position that requires a large amount of effort in the legs to sustain effectively. So time trials are not relaxed. Time trials are you get from point A to point B as fast as possible. There's a lot of research showing that more aerodynamic positions actually are less, or what we perceive, bigger differentials are not necessarily more aerodynamic because the body's making more noise to stay on the bike. The difference between regular road bike positioning and a time trial position is that a, ta tri a time trialist would like to get as far forward as they can so they can create a lot of power on the bike, but they are limited by UCI regulations. Um, so the saddle on a time trial bike will usually be five centimeters behind the bottom bracket, the nose of the saddle always. There are some exemptions now where you, and I, it's more than I can get into here, there's an exemption where you can have the nose of the saddle directly over the bottom bracket if you don't take an exemption at the extensions, blah, 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 blah. But yes, they're different. It's more forward saddle positioning and a much uh, more aggressive uh, trunk angle. All right, great. That's the, uh, that's the end of the questions that we have uh, uh, on uh, live here. Uh, we will post this recording uh, on the website and on our forum, and if there's additional questions, we can continue the discussion there. So thanks so much, Chris, for giving us this uh, wonderful presentation today. Okay, great. All right, thanks, everybody.